two, one, and we are live with John Laughlin. What's up, man? Cheers. <laughs> man, good to catch up with you. Man, I'm, I'm pumped for this. Hell yeah. Uh, yeah. I saw you had Chris and Kyle on, and now we, uh, we're, we're getting through the 405, man. Yeah, this is the uh, Conversations podcast with your host, Nick Worley. Old friend of mine, John Laughlin. Uh, we lived together senior year of college at Indiana. He was the uh, ambassador for the for the hot tub that we had at our college house. <laughs> oh man, that that hot tub. Yeah, yeah. as you as you can imagine, a, a undergrad college house having a hot tub. It, yeah, it, it had seen it had seen better days. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we had to put all these chemicals in it. And I remember like there was always this like rigmarole around like putting enough chemicals in or like if we didn't put enough or too much, then it would throw off the pH, you know? I know. And, and I was <laughs> I was the like project manager or the uh, the accountability owner of the hot tub. And I was definitely a C plus B minus man like man team manager of the of the hot tub. And yeah, those those were the days. But our, our senior year was so much fun. And yeah. Uh, I think just a ton of self-discovery and yeah, dude. And, and growth that yeah. Year. I feel like all of us had our own little journey we were going through. I had just gotten back from Spain where I studied abroad and I remember I was just like so open, well, eyes wide open, the world has so much to offer me, but I was so like ready to go and like I wasn't able to be present. And now I'm doing a lot of work about like, okay, like, as I work in tech, you work in tech, how do I really make the most out of this day, right? And like stay present in this meeting. Like I'll be on my phone scrolling when I'm, you know, on a Zoom call or something. If there's no like camera, it's like, Nick, just be here, right? Like be present with the person you're with. So, you know, that's always been a challenge for me. Man, I, I, I can totally uh, not only empathize, but I mean, that's me. Like yeah. I, I, I fight dis distraction and a lack of focus all the time. Yeah. You know, whether it's uh, checking, checking Twitter, uh, checking the personal email, checking work email. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a, it's a, it's a challenge to be as present, uh, engaged, focused and active, and active listening and participation. I, I, it's not, it's not something you can kind of, uh, perfect. I feel like it's a never yeah. ending journey. And yeah. I, I love that about your podcast, Nick, that you kind of dig into that. Yeah. Because, um, I think there's definitely something there. And I think we all can kind of work at that. Yeah. It's almost like our programming as humans is kind of like antiquated in that we are always, oh, there's a hunter coming to get me or like, I need to go and find some food. And it's like 2021, we have amazing coffee in front of us. We have we have berries, we have, you know, plenty of meat over at Kroger and Meyer. We don't need to be anxious about where we find our next meal or shelter, right? So it's, you know, we got to graduate from that anxious mindset. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I think, um, at least for me, I've found it super, um, super hard to keep that attention span. Yeah, I, I think, and I, I think part of it is, um, with the rise of social media, totally uh, everything kind of being on your phone or on your laptop is yeah. such a challenge to um, to not kind of fall into the the immediate gratification jollies that you get. The jollies out of, <laughs> out, of, out of that like quick, you know, that quick like oh break breaking news on my ESPN app or yeah um, you know or or you know someone on Twitter posted this and mm -hmm. reading through comments it's like is that necessary for me to be distracted from something that I should probably be more focused on yeah yeah I remember you and I like you know micro econ and the, I, oh the, the concept of marginal utility you know and it's like your first fry of the McDonald's fry bag right it's going to be like 10 out of 10 utility and then every fry under it has decreasing marginal utility and it's like, what is the unit to measure that? Jollies. <laughs> oh, man. I know you remember our, our professor's oh, name. Karim. Karim. <laughs> the, 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 the advanced econ class where we're talking about capital. Like, it's like oh, it was two units of capital. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, micro econ was, was not my jam. 
and I remember ha having to, to study my ass off in, in yeah. that class. But yeah, the, the jollies and the, the, you know, the marginal utility and value yes. was, was definitely a, a fun, <laughs> fun learning in that class. I think that I, like, I haven't thought about that in forever. I think business though, if you can really understand econ, supply, demand, you know, like even things like externalities, like what happens if this happens that you don't even realize happens later, right? Yeah. Like that's, that's all really awesome concepts to like, to grasp. And you don't need to know, I mean, at least what I, what I do, I don't need to know like calculus formulas or deep accounting equations, right? But I do need to understand, okay, when this, when there's this much in the market, customers are going to view that as not as valuable as someone that offers this competitive advantage with, with a deeper demand, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think uh, basic principles of economics are very applicable to many different business units. So what I mean by that is, in my opinion, if you're a salesperson or a marketing person and you're, um, you're trying to really grasp what your competitive advantage is, yeah. Uh, you know, I'm uh, constantly talking for near the box or even meeting entrepreneurs who yeah. are trying to zero in on what their differentiators are. Totally. Um, you know, every, every pitch deck uh, or many pitch decks will have a, a chart that kind of lists features or benefits. Yeah. And then there's columns for who the competitors are. Yeah. And the check marks that your product or your company has versus the others sure. is something that investors, partners are always, always. interested in. So yeah. the the supply and demand and, and the externality and, and being uh, and differentiators is, I, I think, un understanding kind of those core economics principles is, yeah. uh, is huge. Yeah. Tell me more about Near the Box. What are you guys up to? What what the, what does the product offer in the market? You know, yeah. what's your role with them? Tell me all about that. Yeah. So we were we were talking before this. Um, I, I started at Near the Box in August of last year, mm -hmm. and the company was founded actually by my college roommate, my junior year, Adi. Yeah. So we we are a technical partnership company. Okay. Um, which means that with non-technical entrepreneurs who are starting a company that's tech enabled or application enabled or, or, or digital product oriented. Yeah. You know, they wouldn't know how to write that first line of code or think about, you know, what their technical architecture should be or okay. what their feature set should be or how sure. they should kind of build a, a scalable platform. And that's kind of where we come in as uh, as kind of an engineering partner and a, and a strategy partner for okay. particularly startup companies. Okay. So do you always start with someone who's non-technical and then, or someone who has a lack of, of knowledge or skills in one area and you guys help consult or are you more of a middleman that helps them find someone that can do what they have to do? Um, so, I mean, we, we work with, um, we work with all kinds of, of founders. Um, you know, sometimes the founding team might have a, a technical lead. Okay. And then our team would kind of come in and do the, the engineering piece. Got it. Um, but what's unique about us is, you know, Adi is kind of a, a Swiss army knife where he can kind of not only uh, lead and manage our engineering team, but mm -hmm. also can kind of flex into being uh, kind of a fractional head of engineering or CTO. Yeah. Uh, for the founding team if, if that need is there. Yeah. Does that cool. make sense? Yeah. So you start with a founder always, whether the founder is technical or sales oriented or marketing, like they, then you help the founder fill gaps that they, that they might have. Yeah. Yeah. And, and typically on the technical engineering side. Okay. So like a, a great example of this would be Airbnb, right? Okay. So Airbnb started as a pair of graphic designers in San Francisco that uh, had a bold idea that, um, when hotels are, are crowded and booked that people would be open to staying in someone else's place. Yeah. And they were graphic designers, but they weren't engineers. Yeah. And so they, uh, they were able to find uh, someone or some entity to uh, build a, a minimum viably, a viable product or yeah. a platform mm -hmm. that, you know, could connect the hosts and, and customers. Yeah. And so we're, we're kind of that, 
that void of finding founders who have uh, validated their value proposition or the, the solution um, that they have, they understand their problem. Yeah. Uh, and then we kind of come in and, and help on the technical side. Yeah. I can tell you're, you're <clears throat> passionate about that, the idea of connecting and like networking and building community, you know, and like, that's almost what the company does in a sense, right? Like you help companies scale with capital or resources or human ability, right? Yeah. So it, it's, it became very clear to me after I started at Near the Box as we um, started working with more and more startup uh, startup customers that um, it, it takes a village. You know, I, I call it kind of a, a startup coalition mm -hmm. where <clears throat> a founding team will have advisors, mentors, um, you know, some that are behind the scenes that are helping them connect to customers, connect to partners, um, challenging them to think about their product or their business model in a different way, kind of understand maybe unique sales channels that they yeah. might not have thought of. And it's been really fun to kind of see um, all the people or different service providers that can help founders bring their idea to life. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. there's a lot of unique partnerships um, that we've explored at Near the Box, whether that's partnering with an accelerator program, uh, you know, that helps kind of startups uh, grow and, and learn tools and be exposed to a framework to mm -hmm. grow their startup in a healthy way. Um, or partnering with uh, with VCs, venture capitalists yeah. that, are, that are, you know, funding these early stage companies. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, environment um, to be in. Yeah, I get it. I get a lot of fulfillment out of it. Good, good, man. So this is a podcast about work styles, work motivations, that kind of thing. Like, when you're sitting in your bed, when you wake up and you come to this amazing office, you know, HQO 1776 Indies incubator, right? What is it that makes you want to come to work? Like, like how do you spend your time? And, you know, how does your motivation shift throughout the day? Curious about that. Yeah, so so what, what makes Near the Box a little bit unique is that we're, sort of a, a startup that's helping startups like yeah. we're a very lean team we're just a group of five yeah um and and i mentioned this earlier but it's i really enjoy the um the lack of swim lanes to my role so autonomy like uh, autonomy yeah trust like uh, adi understands how my experience and skills can complement his core competencies sure. and has a level of trust that I'm able to execute on that. So for me, I, you know, I help with marketing sales and product management for our current customers. So uh, like I am on Slack and, uh, and on Asana with yeah. our engineering team and yeah. constantly emailing our, our customers. Yeah. So it's, it's a, it's a juggling act. Um, but for someone who, in my career, I've had other jobs that have been um, a little bit more defined, a little bit more structured. Yeah. Um, I've, I've found that I, I have a lot more enjoyment when um, I'm able to do different things in my role and that each day is different. Totally. Yeah. I, my first job out of school, I worked at a logistics company. You know, I was a freight broker. So, you know, we had this series of connections between trucking companies. And then my job was to go out and find people that shipped things. And I was sitting at a desk every day, starting at 7 a.m., <laughs> right after the hot tub days. I'm just like, I don't want to be here. My boss is right here, two feet from me, like as close as you and I are. And I'm on the phone from seven to five. And she had to like listen to everything I said. And I, you know, I was critiqued and it was a really nerve wracking experience for a whole year. I did gain some awesome sales skills, but there was zero autonomy. This is how you do it. This is why you do it. This is what you say. Here's your script. And I, I really became a glorified robot, if you think about it. And it was really, really tough to stay there. And so my jump into tech was when I said, I'm over this. Like my creativity, my ability to speak, my ability to communicate is actually being chopped off at the tree trunk right now, right? I need to go and find something that's, that's new and exciting and where I can just even just have the trust of someone that knows that I have the natural abilities to at least be competent, right? Yeah. So that's why I went to Dallas. 
I just went off the cliff. There's, yeah. um, I'd be curious if you agree with this, but I think it's so hard if you're aspiring to be a salesperson pretty young in your career after you maybe graduate college or even yeah. if you don't go to college yeah. to find um, a solid first job where you are coached. Coached, yeah. Um, because uh, I feel like uh, a lot of sales managers for growing companies um, are, are maybe justifiably leery of really young um, green salespeople. Yeah. And my first job out of college, I sold um, LED blinking and flashing promotional merchandise. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty sexy. And, uh, and, uh, and, and the, and the beer and liquor space. Okay. So I, I did that for, for a year. Yeah. And, um, and then I ended up selling physical therapy and chiropractic equipment, which yeah. was just such a different sales experience. Uh -huh. Um, and I also learned a lot in that first sales job, but I mm -hmm. just remember being 22, 23, 24, yeah. um, feeling like I had a, a knack or an inclination or maybe yeah. some raw talent There's to something. be a good salesperson. Yeah. And just, uh, a lot of applications falling on your face. Like there's raw, there's raw talent. Like you know it about yourself. You can see other people validating you sometimes, but you're really failing a lot of the day. You know, it's like, oh, like I messed up again. It's like, you're learning those, what it takes to do well and what it takes to not do so well. And I, yeah, like you said, there's justifiably, I think sales managers and firms are leery of new sales talent because a lot of the people won't, won't last, right? But there has to be a medium between coaching and helping someone get better at what they do while also giving them a quality of life and autonomy and just a basic validation of their human, human element of that person, right? To me, it's, it, it starts with the, the company culture. Yeah. That's um, the, the atmosphere of the company mm -hmm. and the level of caringness of the manager. Right. Yeah, the, the person that is doing the coaching uh, yeah. ha has to has to be patient. Yeah, has to be kind. Um, yeah, it it's funny as as I reflect on where I'm at in my career now at, at 32. Yeah, um, and I just started this new job in, in August of last year. But you know, near the box, we're showing some signs of growth, and it's exciting. We're building momentum. Um, but I always try to take a second and introspect and realize that. Um, I've had some awesome managers and mentors sure. that have uh, brought a, a level of professionalism out uh -huh. of me, a, a level of organization. Yeah. Um, and going from a sales role to a project management role. Yeah. Uh, at Avant Healthcare, my my previous employer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it was just such a such a different job. Interesting. And such a different sk skill set. Yeah. Being in project support or project management versus sales. Uh huh. Um, like I, I know that I, I wouldn't be where I'm at uh, in my career today without, you know, two or three people that spring to mind that really coached me up on, yeah, how to have a, a an attention to detail. Yeah. Um, we were talking about that before the podcast. This idea of. I mean, I actually interviewed at AWS and Google last year, and I got to the final round at both. And both those companies have a policy, like no one is allowed to give feedback to why people didn't get the offer. So I got to the final round at both those amazing tech companies. I didn't get the, the offer. I'm like, what could I have done better in that final round? Did I, did I say something wrong? And it's like, you know, I wanted that feedback. So what you're saying about those managers that did give you the feedback and it was a trusted source that you knew had your back, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's so pivotal for your career to say, you could just be falling flat in your face because of one detriment every time. And it takes that one person to say, maybe do this differently, you know? Yeah. And then you can get over that hurdle finally. Yeah. Like I, I was at uh, Avant Healthcare for five years and I alluded to this, but Ashley Ray, Leah Meisner, uh, Stephanie Bartel, and Audrey Schnelker, Jennifer Goodnight, my five managers there over a five year period of time. And when I think back um, about how I was when I first started and then where I was at the end, um, just, uh, just a, a 
a professional versus being you know, someone in their early 20s. Totally. Who's just kind of a kind of a joke. Yeah. Like, to, to be totally honest. I'm and, with you, man. Yeah. And they they were um yeah, I I, I the manager um subordinate relationship is is really unique and it takes vulnerability on both sides totally because the manager has to be vulnerable in their feedback if it's going to be constructive criticism yeah uh it's it's hard it's hard to give negative feedback to someone yeah um and then you got to be open to it and i think you yeah. and I, you and i are the same way like, yeah there's yeah. a quest for and i love i love this about you as a friend a, qu a quest for learning a yeah. quest to improve to understand to to become excellent to become in the know right like not even excellent just to improve like what what could i be doing better you know yeah what do i don't what do i not see right now what's the perspective that i can't view because of my previous experience you yeah know? so hell yeah cheers man <laughs> got, got deep got deep there yeah dude so you had all women managers <laughs> at, at Avant. Yeah, it was uh, it was unique. I mean, it was a marketing agency or a healthcare communications agency that was in the pharma space. And uh, one time, I was on a, a bus ride with our uh, our head of human resources. We were going to uh, a, uh, a nonprofit volunteer activity, and she uh, she confided to me that that 72% of, of the company was, was female. Uh, and so, yeah, that the odds were, were always gonna be that <laughs> I was gonna have a ton of female uh, colleagues, managers yeah. and- Nice. Um, I, I grew up with, with three sisters. So I, um, yeah, I, I, that was not something that was, you know bothered me or was an issue yeah well i wanted to maybe start wrapping up here i know you have a hard stop but you know we have a few minutes here yeah um man we covered so much from tech to like management to what you do at near the box now um just kind of curious what life in indy is like right now you know i, I can feel an, a certain energy in indianapolis here and i can you know i feel like it's growing what's it like being here yeah, it's, um, I love it here in Indy. Uh, it's, it's a really, um, I, to me, it's a, it's a vibrant city yeah. at, at this point. Uh, and, and I have kind of a nerdy his, his, historian kind of perspective. At, for some, I, I find a, lo a lot of charm in Midwestern uh, mid-sized cities and kind of, getting to know people in different mm -hmm. startup communities across the Midwest. Um, I've had just a ton of really friendly, kind people that have been open to having a 30 minute or 45 minute Zoom with me when they would have no reason to, to do yeah. so. Yeah. Um, so I think Indy, Indy is, is, a, is a great place. Um, and it's, it's strange, like I grew up in Indy um, spent some time in Carmel, mm -hmm. went to IU and then boomerang back to Indy and I haven't lived anywhere else. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I talked to my wife about this, it's, you know, would, would we want to live in a different city um, and experience that? And it's something, something to wrestle with, but, um, but yeah, I love it. I yeah. love it here. And I, I think there's, there's a, a good amount to do um all the benefits none of the negative of a really big city right like you have all the options all the sports teams all the culture amazing food right but it's none of the bs that you get in chicago or new york yeah and and not a knock against chicago because uh, i mean i think chicago is one of the most wonderful places to be in the world in the summertime um and i'm i'm there you know every every other month in the summertime to take in a cubs game and yeah. and hang out with some friends and family. But for me and what I do and my personality and where I'm at, Indy is, is a great place. Yeah, dude. I'm so glad to be back here and just see it all. I mean, great space you have here. Congrats on the, the role at Near the Box. And I, I can see that you're doing well. You're, you're super happy. And I'm glad that Johnny is now a tech bro. <laughs> <laughs> tech bro. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm in a really good place. And nice. Um, yeah, dude, great to, great to catch up. Absolutely, man. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's wrap it up 
and hopefully talk to you soon. Cheers. See you, buddy. Bye. Bye.